All right, welcome, and we are so excited to have you all here for our Semester Roundup and Financial Aid Best Practices with Texas Encores. So today we're going to focus on the FAFSA simplification process and the TASFA, and we're also very excited to talk about a resource which may be new for some. It is Wyatt, a digital FAFSA advisor, and we have some wonderful guests with us today who are going to speak about what Wyatt is and discuss it in more detail. So let's take a quick look at the agenda. First, we have our welcome and overview, and then we will dive into our bright ideas, followed by information on the FAFSA. Then I'm gonna hand it over to our guests from Wyatt, which is a great tool that can help students with the FAFSA. And after that, we're gonna transition over to the TASFA. And then we're going to take a look at our resource spotlight, and we will have time for Q&A at the end of the session. I know there might be some questions, and we do ask if you could just please add your questions to that Q&A box on your Zoom bar. That would be very helpful. It just really helps us, you know, kind of keep track of your questions so we don't miss any. So before we dive into these resources and tools, I would like to share with you a little bit about our professional learning series. This year, in addition to our monthly webinars, we are also introducing coffee chats. And that, that might be something that many of you have already participated in because we started them last semester in August and they're a lot of fun. Our next coffee chat will be on... January 30th at 10 a.m. And it is an extension of this conversation. This is a great opportunity for you to be in a breakout room with your colleagues and collaborate about some financial aid best practices. Who knows what kind of key things you might take away and be able to kind of use in your own practice. And if you scan the QR code on the screen, then you will actually be taken directly to the registration page for the coffee chat. So again, it's just 30 minutes. There is no prep needed. Just bring your favorite morning drink of choice, water, tea, coffee, whatever it may be, and come have a good time. And we definitely hope to see you there. So if you've not had a chance to look at all of the professional learning se sessions that we offer, you can do so now. We just dropped this document into the chat and you can see all of our past sessions and coffee chats as well as upcoming sessions. You can mark your calendars, register for any of them. And like I said, we just dropped the link in the chat, but we have a lot of great things coming up. So definitely check that out and register for the ones that you wanna participate in. And guys, we are so excited to announce our spring outreach schedule for the upcoming semester. So now our spring outreach is actually going to be in addition to our professional learning sessions and coffee chats. Our first session will be in February on the 22nd at 10 a.m., and it will focus on financial aid simplified. Is it really that simple? And it's going to focus on FAFSA and TASFA updates. So now we will continue to have one session every month of these spring outreach sessions, and the last one will be in May. Um, we're going to be sending out this schedule and our follow-up emails so that you can sign up for any of these sessions, and we really hope you attend. There are going to be some wonderful presentations with just some really great content, update all of those wonderful things. And again, this is in addition to our professional learning series that we do like this one and our coffee chats. So your host for today's webinar is the Professional Learning and Engagement Team. My name is Lauren Disher. I'm the Professional Learning Coordinator, and I joined the team in February 2023. Prior to this, I was a college and career advisor for a high school here in Austin, Texas, and I now have the pleasure of working with Laura Guggen, who I will give um, a chance to introduce herself. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. I know it's um, 
really early on in the semester. We're really happy you all joined us. There's a lot of focus on financial aid right now. It's great to be here. I'm Laura Guggen, Director of Professional Learning and Engagement. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jared. He's going to join us later on. Um, Andrea is not here, um, isn't able to join us this morning, but she's usually part of all of our professional learning series and our spring outreach. So Jared, do you want to say hello? Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jared Garza. I am the Network Marketing Coordinator here with the Professional Learning and Engagement Team at Texas Oncourse. Um, I started with the team in September of 2023, and my previous role was as a financial aid advisor. So happy to be here with y'all, and thank y'all for joining us. Thank you guys so much. We are also very excited to have our guests from Wyatt here with us today. Laura and Nita, I will kick it over to you so that you can introduce yourself. Great, thanks so much, Lauren. Uh, my name is Laura Kane, Kane like Candy Kane, and excited to be here to share more about Wyatt. I'm a senior advisor with Benefits Data Trust and formerly led school counseling and college initiatives at Mastery Schools in Philly for over a decade, as well as was at U Aspire, launching the training programs and policy and systems change divisions for a decade as well. Over to you, Nita. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us today. My name is Nita Sinalker. I'm the Director of Higher Education Innovation at Benefits Data Trust. Um, in my role, I oversee our work to connect students and college students to financial aid and public benefits that can help them afford the cost of attending college. So excited to be here to talk to you all about Wyatt. Excellent. Thank you both so much. So we may have a few folks on the line who are new to us. So I just want to take a quick minute to introduce Texas Oncourse. And we do that by starting with our mission. So with Texas Oncourse, all Texas students, no matter where they come from or where they're headed, have a plan for success after high school. So all of the materials that we produce and all of the trainings that Texas Oncourse hosts, we always begin with this mission in mind, that the work we are doing is to help our students have a valuable plan after high school. So we are a state-funded initiative designed to improve college and career advising and readiness across the state of Texas. We were created at the request of the Texas legislator that works in partnership with the governor's tri-agency workforce initiative. And all of these organizations really work together to connect education and industry here in Texas. And the users of our tools, they include middle and high school counselors, teachers, administrators, and community-based organizations that really focus on post-secondary success. We also provide resources for students and their families. So Texas Oncourse's approach is this task by simplifying the post-secondary planning process through free digital tools, educator training, and up-to-date information with a library of resources, which are just outstanding. So now I am very excited to bring to you our bright ideas because guys, we wanted to hear from you and we know that you wanna hear from each other. So for this session, we decided to ask a question during the registration process. So we asked, what is the one thing you do in your current role to meet the financial aid graduation requirement? And let me tell you, we cannot thank you enough for all of the wonderful responses we received. Thank you so much for your participation. We read them all. There were some phenomenal responses. And as we reviewed them, we really noticed three major themes, training your team, hosting financial aid events, and meeting one-on-one -on -one with your students. So the first bright idea that we're going to discuss is that one-on-one -on -one student tracking. Pedro Macias, the TRIO coordinator from UTSA, thank you so much, Pedro, stated that he plans to meet one-on-one -on -one with his students. And we actually had a few people who responded with something very similar. Um, for example, we had one guest from San Antonio ISD that say that she also planned to meet with every student. So this method is not only happening in higher education, but at the high school level as well. Now, meeting one-on-one -on -one with your students may seem unattainable with your current workload. I know counselors do a lot and have a lot going on, 
teachers do, educators just do in general. So consider maybe working with campus staff at your school just to help ensure that this happens. You can work with your internal partners, um, any college advising programs within your school, senior English teachers, or any representatives that you work with from institutions of higher education, or maybe even senior admin to really help achieve this goal. You can also look at the Texas Encore's financial aid toolkits, and they have experiences and best practices that relate to just helping schools increase these financial aid completion rates. rates. And there are a lot of best practices listed that relate to reaching students, training staff, and connecting with community partners, all within these wonderful financial aid toolkits that you can download on our website. So now we have more bright ideas sprinkled in throughout the rest of the presentation that cover each of those three major themes. All right, guys, let's get into it. Let's talk about FAFSA. Now, first, we want to know our audience a little better, kind of like we mentioned at the beginning. How experienced are you with the FAFSA? If you don't mind just dropping into the chat a B for beginner, A for average, E for experienced. I'm seeing some Bs come in, lots of beginners. We got an average beginner. I think I saw an experience. Oh, there's an experienced. Excellent. A couple experienced. Average beginner. I was E, now B. That is a great response as well. Fabulous. Thank you guys so much. Average, fabulous. It's interesting because with this new FAFSA, it's almost like we are all beginners but we will definitely dive into it and um, get really good at it and be experienced in no time. So we're going to start off by talking about some new terms. So let's just go ahead and dive in and we're going to go through each one of these. The first is that financial aid direct data exchange, and it's the process of bringing over applicant or contributor information from the IRS. Now let's talk about the Student Aid Index, or SAI. Now this is going to replace that old term, estimated family contribution. And SAI also has a new calculation, and applicants may see SAIs as low as negative $1,500. The third term we want to highlight today is that the people involved with providing information on the applicant's FAFSA are now called contributors. So this can include a student, a spouse, a biological parent, or a step-parent. Now that we have looked at some of those new terms, let's focus on new processes. So again, we're going to go through these just kind of one by one and really break it down. So first up, we have that FSA ID. Now, all contributors must create and verify an FSA ID before they can access the FAFSA. This includes parents without a social security number. Parents without a social security number have to verify their identity by answering one to four knowledge-based verification questions via a transunion. Now let's talk about the direct data exchange. This means that all contributors must consent to have their tax information transferred from the IRS, and this includes non-tax filers, those filing those foreign tax returns, and undocumented parents. Otherwise, FSA will not process the application or calculate the Student Aid Index, or SAI. Now let's talk about parent contributors. Parent contributors for dependent students with separated or divorced parents. The parent providing the most financial support must be included in the FAFSA, even if the student lived with the other parent more often. And last but not least, we have a great change that has happened, and that is that school selection. Students can now select up to 20 colleges to send their FAFSA to. It used to be 10, so it's quite the increase and good news for those students who want to apply to more than 10. Now let's talk about formula changes, right? So here are some of the formula changes that we want to highlight. Again, we're just going to break it down, guys. Now the family size is going to be automatically calculated based on the number of individuals claimed on the tax return. If the family size is different from the tax return, then there will be an option to enter it manually. 
businesses and farm assets is that the net value of any business or farm must be included as an asset on the FAFSA. This is new this year. That next one is number in college is no longer included in the SAI calculation. So you're still going to see this question on the FAFSA, but just know it is only asked for institutional purposes and will not be used in that final calculation. That last one is that the family adjusted gross income or AGI, if it's greater than $60,000, then they will be required to report asset information. So the next few slides that we're going to share with you were created by you Aspire. So thank you, you Aspire, for providing us with this great content. And they cover what is currently happening with the FAFSA. Okay, guys, so here's what happened. On December 31st, the 24-25 FAFSA opened with a soft launch. And let me tell you guys, on the 31st, it was only open for about 60 minutes before it went into a planned pause. So right now, FAFSA will be available intermittently. FSA is on the verge of getting it open 24-7, but for now, you may experience some pauses, you might be put into a waiting room, and if the form is down, if you go to fill it out and it's down, just check the banner at the top of the screen to find out when it will be back up and try again later. Now let's talk about some good news. Contributors without social security numbers can now create an FSA ID, which is awesome. Now, during this soft launch, FAFSA applications can be submitted, but they will not be processed until late January, meaning that colleges will not receive FAFSA data until late January. So once the college receives the student's information, then they will be able to provide students with personalized A's, but just know that won't happen until later on in the month. So let's talk about what happens after the FAFSA has been submitted. Student submits the FAFSA, what happens? Well, so the FAFSA submission summar summaries should be available in late January. And until then, no corrections or updates can be made. So that's important to keep in mind that until they get that submission summary, they cannot make any corrections or updates. Students will still receive a confirmation email with their estimated student aid index and Pell eligibility. So make sure that they're checking their email, make sure that they have good emails. That is one great practice to start with your students, just having them check their email regularly. So what does this mean, guys? How will this soft launch impact campus staff and students? How can we navigate this soft launch? One idea is to plan financial aid events for February or maybe late January. You can also encourage students who do submit during the soft launch to use verified FSA IDs and make sure all contributors grant consent. Also, keep any initial confirmation email until FAFSA summaries are available. So these are all some just great practice to help us get through this soft launch, get through this beginning part so that we can go ahead and be successful with our students. So now let's look at some FAFSA data at the state level. So this data is from the website Form Your Future, and it is run by NCAN. It's such a great resource with some great information, and they report on state financial aid completion rates. And guys, Texas deserves a great job because in 2023, Texas was number five for having the highest number of seniors complete the FAFSA application with 66.7%. That's phenomenal. It's such an outstanding achievement and it is because of your hard work, dedication, and just genuine commitment to your students. You deserve a pat on the back for your hard work and we will be sharing this link in the follow-up email so that you can continue to track Texas's progress. 
So we talked about state level data. Now let's look at some student level data. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Apply Texas Counselor Suite, but this feature will allow you to track students at your school who have started or completed a FAFSA application or an admissions application. You can also create reports on the financial aid data and admissions information, and you can kind of see like where your students are in their FAFSA applications, which could be a really great tool to kind of help them along in the process. Now, in order to access the Apply Counselor Suite, you have to um, contact your ESC representative. They will verify your information and then send you a link to set up an account. And again, we will send all of this information, how to access this account in our follow-up email. There's going to be some great resources in there. So definitely check that out. All right, it is time for our next bright idea. Thank you to Simone Barnes, the College Career and Military Readiness Specialist from New Caney ISD, who is going to assist counselors with the new FAFSA information so that, that they can help students. Guys, this is another great idea and best practice that you might also want to implement on your campus. You can provide campus staff who help students with the financial aid applications with updates about the Better FAFSA. You can send emails with links to helpful websites such as the Texas Encourse Academy. There's some great resources in there. Our financial aid toolkits are also really helpful. Or you can link to NCAN's Better FAFSA website. NCAN has a ton of great training resources um, within their website. And again, we're gonna be sending all of that out to you in our follow-up email. Just some really great resources in there. But you could also, you know, host an information session for your campus staff. You can go over new terms, processes, calculations, and all of these things together can just help prepare everyone on your campus, be ready to help students who are working on the FAFSA. So now if your student is unable to complete either the FAFSA or TASFA applications, they can fill out the financial aid opt-out form. This form can be found on the TEA website and we will send out a link to this form in our follow-up email. The form is in English and Spanish and if a student completes it and it's signed by a parent, if the student is under 18, then that student has satisfied their graduation requirement. So this could be another route for those students who are unable to fill out the FAFSA or the TASFA. All right, that is all we have for FAFSA this morning. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Laura and Nita so they can talk about this wonderful resource, Wyatt. Terrific. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, so first off, just want to introduce Benefits Data Trust, or BDT. We are a national nonprofit who modernizes benefits to help people build pathways to economic mobility. And you may be aware or you may not know that $80 billion a year goes untapped in public assistance for food, financial aid, and health care. And so BDT, we help streamline that process in a dignified way to get the supports for folks who need it. And in this slide, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but you know that timely FAFSA completion is more critical this year than ever before. Um, there's extra confusion as well as quite a time crunch. So just reminders about the context, there are increased equity concerns this year due to already existing pandemic enrollment declines, plus the June SCOTUS decision um, to eliminate affirmative action from the college process and information on race and ethnicity in college applications, as well as now the delayed FAFSA, which has limited institutions from having information about income status of applicants. Of course, I think counselors are feeling it as much as um, anyone, with the exception of probably financial aid administrators, that there's a time crunch like no other. Over a million students typically complete the FAFSA from October 1 to December 31st, and now there's less time to submit that FAFSA, and yet deadlines are very present. In fact, uh, many institutions are currently writing students and asking them to complete it within a, a mid-January timeframe. So it's important for students to get support as quickly as possible, and yet there's more students than ever needing that help. 
third, typically students actually not quite yet on the slide, please. Um, the third thing that really is important is that students typically go and Google support to find out what to do. And we've done a lot of user testing with students and that is uh, very common, of course, for how they solve their problems. But there's a lot of increased confusion because a much of what students might Google for would be inaccurate based upon the new 24-25 FAFSA. So not everyone is as fortunate as y'all to get the helpful highlights that Lauren just went over um, that emphasizes a lot of those changes. And lastly, getting access to support is really important to use other solutions such as technology to reach some of the and answer some of the basic questions about FAFSA so that folks can spend more time on the more complex issues with students as they need it. So we're here today to introduce you to Wyatt. Again, BDT is a nonprofit and we've used Wyatt, which is a digital advisor tool since 2019. And we're really excited to relaunch it this year um, to help meet the moment of these challenges for FAFSA and for students and counselors. Uh, Wyatt includes two things. One is proactive text reminders where regular notifications are sent to students or counselors or parents to help keep the application on track. So we're able to incorporate specific tips for the new FAFSA and help students stay on track with accurate information. So an example of that uh, that was just mentioned is about the FAFSA summary sheet. Right now, students are not able to make corrections, but Wyatt will be able to text students once that availability is provided by FSA. Secondly, once students are in the text thread with Wyatt, they are able to ask any questions they have and get answers as they need them. Uh, this is done all through text messaging and is 24 seven available in the palm of their hands while they have their computer up and working on the FAFSA application. And lastly, why it is always free for students and there's no cost. Taking a little bit of a deeper dive into Wyatt, um, all of this content has been informed by behavioral science principles. This is something BDT specializes in, in our work across different um, access supports around SNAP, around WIC, healthcare, as well as helping students access the Pell Grant. The tool also replies to students' questions immediately, and all of the content we have redesigned this year in partnership with you, Aspire. Uh, our focus of the content has explicitly been for students coming from low-income backgrounds and for those students and families who need the support of Pell Grant and or state aid to enable to afford and access higher education as an engine for economic mobility. And just to give you a couple examples, what happens when a student signs up? So the sign up form, which you'll see a little bit later in the demo, um, really just asks a few questions of students, their first name, their cell phone number, and their state of residence. Uh, this is all that's required. There is no privacy concerns with FAFSA um, or with Wyatt. And students are able to engage in a very safe way without any concerns of security. Students receive biweekly emails um, until they report the FAFSA is completed. The way that they do that is through self-report and they can stop out at any time. And students can ask questions at any time. Uh, they, we really work with having Y just on our phones as counselors and practitioners. We can go ahead and check our own content knowledge to be able to answer questions as we advise students as well. And finally, just to be really specific, the design of Wyatt is very much focused on the barriers for students and where have students been tripped up? This has been informed by decades of expertise from practitioners uh, that have worked on the content, especially those from you Aspire, some of my former colleagues there. And just very specifically, a few of the buckets that we see as problems are about access, especially around FSA IDs and who should start the FAFSA and information about consent. We see problems around technical issues to understand if application has been effectively submitted or an invite sent to a parent or um, if any verification flags have been made. Of course, common questions come in about family composition, about who is part of a household, as well as dependent or independent status for students. Another area is around documentation and what is necessary, especially if students or their parents might not file taxes. And lastly, there's a whole host of other questions, perhaps for specific student groups or otherwise more general about 
which schools to include, et cetera. And now I'll hand it over to Nita who can share a demo of Wyatt and talk about its impact. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Um, so now that we've told you a little bit about Wyatt, we wanna actually show it in action. So if we can go to the next slide, we're gonna hit play on a little video. So you can see here, and this is gonna move a little bit quickly, a student interacting with Wyatt. And so this is sort of what um, you might expect uh, if you or your students sign up to interact with the tool. So Wyatt answers a whole set of contextual questions. We know that students have questions about what is the FAFSA? Why do I need to fill it out? When is it due? Um, and why it answers a whole host of questions that, um, that are really sort of about the process and about um, the context of filling it out. Is the FAFSA required? Um, so this answer is going to be um, the answer that's uh, applicable nationally. I know it is a high school graduation requirement in Texas, so that won't be Texas specific, but um, they can access uh, information about state deadlines um, through some of the links. Uh, and now you're seeing a student get into some more specific questions. How do I edit my FSA ID? This is going to move quickly, but what you saw there was an image um, of the account that actually has an arrow and a red circle around where the student actually needs to click to edit their FSA ID. Um, and now the student is asking, well, is my FSA ID verified by the SSA? Um, and why it is providing information for how they can check that. So now you see the student is getting into questions about their parent and whether they need an FSA ID and which one needs it. Um, and so what you're gonna see Wyatt doing here is starting to ask the student a set of questions so it can better understand how to give the student the best response. So Wyatt is asking the student a series of yes, no questions. The student is responding accordingly. Are your parents married to each other? Do they live together? Um, and is now providing the best response for that student situation. And you can see that this parent, this student has a parent and a step parent. And so is um, getting information about how to fill out the FAFSA. And so this is, you're seeing a closeout se sequence. The student is saying bye. And then Wyatt is reminding the student that they can reply here if they have any questions. They don't need to wait for one of the outreach texts to come up and that they can always access the FAFSA uh, FSA website for additional help. With so that gives you a little taste of what why it looks like in action. Like Laura said on the previous slide, why it uh, answers a whole host of questions about um, a range of issues that we know that trip many students up, um, but hopefully you have a, a sense of what that looks like now. Next slide. We want to tell you a little bit about um, the impact that Wyatt has had. Uh, this is not a new tool. We have been um, uh, making this available since 2019. Uh, to date, we've served over 33,000 students who have accessed over $40 million in federal financial aid. Um, and through an evaluation that we did in 2022, we found that students who use Wyatt um, actually were completing the FAFSA at higher rates uh, than students who were not using uh, Wyatt. And this was after controlling for a pretty wide set of student characteristics. So um, we, we think that uh, Wyatt usage can be extremely helpful for students who need this help. Um, and most importantly, we saw that low-income Wyatt users have a uh, higher FAFSA completion rates than non-low-income users, which is great because those are the students we really need to be filling out the application and accessing those resources. We also have found that students really love chatting with Wyatt. Um, in the last year that we uh, did the evaluation, we found that over three quarters of students who received uh, an outreach text from Wyatt replied to one of those text messages. This is extremely high. I think we all know how difficult it is to engage students, um, especially over a medium like text, even though that is their preferred way of communication. Um, to have 76% of students actually replying to one of those text messages was really, really, um, a really positive outcome. Um, and students really liked using Wyatt. They rated it very highly um, and gave us some really great feedback. And they really enjoy that it is available over text message 24-7. Uh, they don't need to wait for business hours. They don't need to pick up the phone. Um, they, they can access it anytime they want. So 
So as Laura alluded, it's very easy to sign up um, for Wyatt. It is available now at getfafsahelp.org. Um, a student, when they sign up, they will only have to really provide their first name, their phone number, and some very basic uh, geographical information about the state that they're in and who they are, just so Wyatt knows how to talk to them and what sorts of reminder texts to send. For students, once they sign up, they will be getting monthly reminders for the first four weeks and then bi-weekly reminders until they say that they have completed the FAFSA and then Wyatt will stop texting them. This is not um, an indefinite engagement. Uh, Wyatt only wants to be useful uh, for as long as the student needs it around. Um, Wyatt responds to questions anytime. And we, you know, given the evolving context of the FAFSA and how it's launching right now, we are updating content regularly uh, per updates that we're getting from the Department of Education. So it is in real time, um, including information that is as up to date as possible. For educators, you can always go to getfafsahelp.org slash educators. Um, there is, I think that is the link. I think Laura is gonna put it into the chat. Um, there is a whole host of resources for you there to be able to share Wyatt with your students, including flyers and email templates and posters um, and uh, PowerPoint slides that you can put in financial aid night presentations. Um, so we hope that this is helpful and we're taking the burden off of you to figure out how to get this great tool out there. Um, you can also sign up for Wyatt yourself if you would like. You'll get a different set of outreach texts um, and you can ask Wyatt questions to um, help support your conversations with students as they're going on. Um, and here is just a few examples of some of the resources that are available on that educator website. Um, but if you go to that link, you can download all of them. They are also customizable as well. So you can put some of your own information into some of the posters and flyers. And that's all we have. Um, we're really, really excited about the opportunity to support students and educators and families during a really difficult year. And we really, really hope that Wyatt uh, is helpful for you all. And we'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this presentation. Thank you for having us. I'll pass it back thank to you. Lauren. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Laura and Nita, um, uh, to talk about Wyatt. Uh, we There's their contact information right there. Um, and we are uh, keeping track of time here. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the TASFA to round out all of our financial aid information in this webinar. So um, this is just a quick slide on uh, Wyatt and Advi. If you have supported students and had them work in Applied Texas on college applications, you are probably familiar with Advi. Um, so how are they different? Um, I think you, you kind of already know this based on seeing like the Wyatt demo, which I think was really awesome. Great to see like live texting and what Wyatt does with students. It's really impressive. Um, but I'm sure you'll see that Wyatt really specializes in the financial aid process with FAFSA. Answers very direct um, and I would say even complex uh, questions from students um, about the FAFSA process. And if you're not familiar with ADVI, uh, Ask ADVI is the chatbot that we have here at the Higher Ed Coordinating Board. Um, it can be accessed through a student's Apply Texas profile. Students can opt in that way. And ADVI really supports students through the college application process. So we have sort of like tailored campaigns for juniors and also seniors. Those activities, as you all know, are a little bit different. Um, but ADVI supports students in choosing a college, answering questions about essays, recommendation letters, different college um, colleges and universities, and also answers Applied Texas questions. So ADVI will address financial aid um, questions for, for families, certainly, and so there's probably a little bit of overlap, um, but just to address you know, what both of these chatbots are, they are both free chatbots for students. Um, we encourage you, know, you to share this information with your students and families. Um, we're also going to have um, our March uh, professional learning series session is about Ask Advi. So we're going to take a whole um, an hour in March and talk about Advi and what those messages looks, look like. So we'll have a time um, later on this semester to do a deep dive into Advi. So moving on to talk a little bit about TASFA, um, this is just a little check-in with the audience. How experienced are you with the TASFA application? 
Um, we'll do same as before in the chat, B for beginner, A for average, E for experienced, and sometimes those levels change with time. Yeah, it's really, we almost always include TASFA information on financial aid because if you help students and families with FAFSA, you most likely help them with the TASFA. Perfect, thank you all for your, um, for your responses. So FAFSA is here, as Lauren mentioned. It is open, we are in the soft launch. So what that means for our student financial aid services is that we work um, to make sure that the TASFA application really mirrors what is on the FAFSA. And because a lot of that wasn't known to us until December, um, our financial aid office is working on that now. So the FAFSA simplification, simplification does impact TASFA, the timeline and the content of the paper TASFA. And I want to really emphasize that the paper TASFA is open now. It is available now, and it is it is exactly what um, the application that your students should be filling out right now. Um, if you want to process a TASFA right now, um, the paper TASFA form is already released. Jared's going to drop that link in the chat if he hasn't already. And it is also on our website and on the resource, everything we send to you, so you'll get it. Um, so what does that mean for the online TASFA? Um, that means that we are working on the changes. They are in progress, I can promise you that. Um, the online form will be available very soon, hopefully by the end of February. Um, if you receive our emails, if you receive our educator playbook, and you follow us on social media, once the online TASFA is available, we will announce it everywhere that we possibly can, and we can send it to you all, um, everybody that's attended in this session as well. So uh, stay tuned. We will announce when the online form is ready. So that just causes the state priority deadline, which many of you know about um, this year and this unique financial aid season. It's March 15th for those students that are going to be um, you know, enrolling in a college or university in 24-25. So that's the application that your students are going to be filling out. Um, so we will go back to January like normal in future years, but that is where we're at for this season um, and finishing in up that, that up in March. So the next few slides are um, really like the ins and outs or the bones of the TASFA. Um, so you can see here, this is the TASFA landing page on our agency website. Um, so there's some really great things in here just to answer initial questions on whether or not a student needs to fill out the TASFA or they need to fill out um, the, the federal application or the FAFSA. Both are obviously free, um, but now we link out to the FAFSA um, on our landing page if a student needs to do that. So you can see there on the right that TASFA or FAFSA, if students are wondering, maybe they're doing this on their own and they're not sure. I know I've had students in the past that thought they did both. Um, so this is kind of the, the way to navigate through whether or not, uh, which application they do. And then the next slide is really the specific decision tree. So you can see there, I know it's really small font, but they are they're gonna ask students if they are a US citizen, if they are a US national, permanent resident, or they have um, uh, a different uh, uh, specific category of residency or stage. Um, so that decision tree, there's several different uh, eligibility steps or questions that they can look at, and it will direct them to the right um, application. So here is what those look like. And if they meet all of the following criteria, then that will give them a prompt to start the TASFA application. So 
So once the code is uh, input, um, so the user creates their account um, and when they make a TASFA account, uh, which is a very short registration form, and this is also available on a phone as well, so several different devices. After that's created, they log in and they have to use a verification code, which is like everything now, and that is provided via email. So they want to have an active email that they can check regularly to access the code. And then once the code is uh, input and the email is verified, then they get their account, short registration form, and after that's created, they log in and they have access to the TASFA page, which is right here. So this is when they are logged in. User can see various tabs at the top, home, what the application looks like, um, a help button, uh, obviously their name, and they can see that they're logged in. And then in the middle of the screen, that's their apply now, and it will save automatically as they go through the application. And then the on the application page, the user lands on the instructions page, um, and those are available and give the student and parent lots of assistance on how to navigate the application, where they're at, and what they should expect. You can move around the different sections and fill out the application in any order or follow the natural flow, and it will save. So the student answers questions uh, that are specific there to their demographic information, their own dependency, parent information, if it applies, um, family information, the colleges, which currently is 10. Um, I can't say for sure if that's going to change to reflect the 20 that the FAFSA uh, accepts now. Um, but then also, uh, then the final will be the, the submission part of the application menu. And then the student section will have questions on their personal information, income assets, lots of students do work and, and may file, file taxes, um, maybe spouse information um, if that applies, um, and things like federal if federal benefits have received. Um, those questions actually have been moved out of the student section um, and they'll be in its own section for the 24-25 application. Um, so that's one change. And then also as part of the student's personal information, um, the, high, the student's high school will be captured. Um, so that's a screenshot of what that looks like here. Um, the student graduated in Texas, they can pick from the available listing um, of their high school because those are pre-populated. But if it's not included, they can do a manual entry um, and they can do a manual entry if they attended school outside of Texas as well. And then after the student section um, is the dependency section. Um, and this is kind of the equivalent of the FAFSA's student personal circumstances and other circumstances section for 2425. So the dependency questions on age and marital status pre-populate based on answers provided in the student section. Um, so then the parent tab may or may not disappear depending on their dependency status. And then in the next section um, for parents, if the student is a dependent, then the student will uh, fill out the parent section. So all of the information must be filled out on the parent section before the student can have an email sent to the parent to get the required acknowledgement confirmation. So if something is incorrect in the parent section or elsewhere, the student can get go back in and correct it as long as the parent has not uh, checked and acknowledged and um, didn't done a confirmation. Um, some other things just to note in the parent section, there is skip logic. So if the, if the parent identifies as not married, then the parent too will disappear or be hidden. And the parent must also have a, an email that is different from the student email to access the TASFA to complete the required acknowledgement confirmation. So these are things that are just great to check on um, before students get all the way through this process. 
And then the college section, um, available, available college listings will also be updated as they're selected here. Um, as I mentioned, the user can add up to 10 colleges and also remove prior to submission, but just clicking on that college uh, tab. And the housing status is required because that can make a really big difference in um, obviously the cost. And college student ID is there, but it's optional. Students may or may not have a college ID for where they're applying. And we're getting really close to uh, just the submit section and finalizing the TASFA steps. This is the last section. Um, and here a student will see if they have any incomplete sections. So those incomplete sections will come up with red. It'll show on a banner with hyperlinks to the application and they can go directly to that area to finish. And then once all the errors are cleared um, and, it, and the student will acknowledge and submit if they are independent and if they are dependent, they will be able to send their application for their parent to review and acknowledge um, right there with that email click on that green green button. That link is good for 24 hours and use user can send additional links if there's an issue there. Um, and that email confirmation looks like that. Um, and folks can always, students can, can always go in and send that again if they need to. So once the parent receives an email from the application, they'll click through the prompts. Um, they'll click on the link in the email to launch a new browser, and they must enter three specific student validation items to access the application. Those three items are the student's email, the student's application ID, and the student's date of birth. So the student will have to give them this information, and if the information is incorrect, they won't be able to access the full application. And then one, the, once the parent uses the secure credentials to access the application, they have read-only access. They uh, cannot make any update, updates. And if they see any issues, they'll have to alert the student to make those updates. They shouldn't sign unless all of the information is correct. So there is some collaboration that's needed here um, if the parents are filling out uh, this portion or completing this portion with the student. And then once they have reviewed the application, they go to the submit section and then they will acknowledge and hit that green button. And then once the parent checks that acknowledgement statement box and hits that green button, a confirmation page, which looks exactly like this, will show up. Um, and then the student will receive the colleges um, and then click the acknowledgement statement and the green submit application at the bottom. So those are just the last few final steps. You can always see here um, under those colleges, the date that it was submitted to those colleges. Students can print a copy of their submitted TASFA by school in PDF format. Um, and currently they can add up to 10 colleges. So this is the last bright idea we wanted to share. Um, uh, Jada Caesar uh, talked a little bit about holding workshops to help families file taxes and complete the FAFSA. So events, if you didn't know you were an event planner as a college and advisor, um, you do end up doing that quite a bit. Um, some of them might, might be virtual, some of them might be in your uh, school gym, some of them might be at um, off-site, but hosting financial aid and completion nights um, was definitely a theme from everyone we heard from. It increases parent participation. A lot of times you can get folks to donate food or make it fun um, to, to help them and support them with this process. Translators are really helpful to have for your non-English speaking families. Inviting your local IHG staff and providing those toolkits or using those um, are great resources to support your events. 
All right, I'm gonna kick it over to Jared. I know we have about five minutes left. Um, he's gonna spotlight some resources and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, Laura. Um, our first resource for the resource spotlight is the Quick Guide to Financial Aid Application Changes. With changes to the FAFSA and TASWA comes new terminology. Our team at Texas Encores has created a quick guide where you can find the summaries of the new changes, terms, and, import, and important priority deadline information. Our second resource is the financial aid requirement website and toolkits provided by Texas Encores. For more help and resources on meeting that financial aid graduation requirement, check out our financial aid website and toolkits. No matter what your role is in the application process, you will find resources targeted to help you support students and families. Our third resource is the online or downloadable resources provided by Texas Encores. Um, each web page and downloadable toolkit features important information, links to curated resources, and tips for successfully completing a FAFSA or TASFA. These resources have been recently updated based on feedback from counselors, families, community partners, and students, and we have begun to update information based on the financial aid simplification changes. All Texas Encores produced resources and handouts are available in English and Spanish, and additional Spanish language resources are also linked when available. Our next resource is the Tuition Guarantee Programs Chart. Um, this document features information about over 20 tuition support programs available to Texas residents. These institutions pledge to support students that meet program requirements with a combination of grants and scholarship to cover the cost of tuition, and in some cases, additional fees. This document is also available in Spanish to support your non-English speaking students and families as they explore their college options. I do wanna note, that some of these programs have application or admission deadlines that differ for the 2023-2024 school year due to, due to the delay of the financial aid application release. Be sure that when advising your students regarding these programs that you know updated deadlines. And our final resource is the FAFSA and TASFA modules. In the Texas Encourse Academy, you can complete our FAFSA and TASFA modules to learn more about all the recent updates and find additional learning resources to help you better support your students in the financial aid application completion process. All of our FAFSA and TASFA resources are being updated to reflect changes based on FAFSA simplification and online TASFA release. We are working hard to make sure that our resources reflect the information you need to help your students be successful. And now I will hand it over to Lauren for FAFSA current soft launch details and timelines. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all so much. This has been such an amazing webinar and I hope everybody got a lot of great information. We're going to go ahead and close it out real quick. I am I know that we only have like two minutes left. Real quick, if you scan this QR code, you will be taken directly to the FSA website where you can read the details about the soft launch, what it means for students, what it means for families, and what it means for you. There are some great resources within the website that is connected to this QR code. I highly recommend checking it out. Again, please know that all of this information will be shared after today, so you will get a follow-up email with all of these links, all of this information. So rest assured that you will get this. You can also just look at um, the FSA website, studentaid.gov, and check out all of the information they have uh, about the soft launch. Hello again, everyone. I just wanted to highlight our YouTube channel here at Texas Encourse. Uh, we're currently at 920 subscribers and we're looking to reach 950 subscribers by the end of the academic year. If you end up missing a session, all webinars are uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Thank you all for joining us. And now I'll pass it back to Lauren for questions and comments. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions and comments. I'm going to just move it on to this last slide real quick. We do love your feedback. We love to hear what you think. So if you can get a, just a chance while we're answering these questions, just scan this QR code. It's like a four question survey. We'd really appreciate it. We love to hear from you guys and we do take all of your responses to heart just to make sure that these um, sessions we are providing are just really great and jam-packed with some great information like today since we've almost run out of time. But I'll go ahead and just go ahead and start look at some of the questions that we got. Lauren, I did wanna, um, there were a couple of questions I wanted to see if Nita and Laura wanted to address live. If you all are not able to stay with us, that's fine, but we can stay on a, for a few minutes and answer questions. Um, if you wanted to address anything that anyone has asked, please go ahead and do that. I know. Thanks. I, go ahead, Laura. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks so much. We went ahead and answered it in the chat, just uh, keeping track of time and, and all the important information shared here today. 
So one question was just about escalating if Wyatt is unable to answer questions, how that might escalate to human support. And we clarified that we aren't able to offer that in the national free version of Wyatt, but that we do give reference and Wyatt does acknowledge if the, the answer that is needed is beyond its capacity to support the students. There was also a question about um, mass sign up students for Wyatt. And unfortunately, because of um, FCC regulations, in order to do texting outreach, each student does need to personally opt in to receive communication from Wyatt. So you cannot uh, mass sign them up. However, in the educator resource page that we highlighted, you can um, use those tools with QR codes as well as drafted newsletters or emails that you could put in Naviance, et cetera. Um, there's ways to do mass sharing of information that's already drafted. And also you can customize it to however you see fit. So we tried to get the next best thing available and in counselor's hands knowing how busy you are. That's great, Laura. Thank you. And I did receive one question on the Applied Texas Counselor Suite and how often the data is updated. Um, I know nobody put it in the chat or the Q&A here, but the question was how often are FAFSA TASFA data updated for students and that student level data? And the answer is once we start receiving the um, completion or the application status from the Department of Education, we put that in daily um, once we start receiving it from the Department of Education. So currently I don't know exactly when that's going to be. It should be fairly soon for you to see your students. And then we will um, also update the TASFA information daily. Um, so it will mirror or reflect the way the FAFSA looks, uh, the way the FAFSA data looks. And like I said, that information in the counselor suite is updated daily. Excellent. I think, did we answer all the other questions? I see one in the chat. I do st still see my class of 20 through 2023 students. Um, yes, we are working diligently to get that updated, and that should change very soon um, in your Applied Texas portal. Excellent. Any other questions before we sign out for today? I know there were some um, great questions answered in the chat, and we have have one, what is the YouTube link? That one, if you actually just go to YouTube and search Texas Encourse, you can find our channel and look at all of these great resources and um, recordings. I'm glad you asked, that's a great one. And again, we'll just send out that link when we do send out that follow-up email, but thank you for asking that. And um, ho hopefully you go and subscribe. Is there anything else? All right. I think we've covered everything. And I just saw that Jared, thank you so much. He put that link into the chat so you can subscribe there. Well, everyone, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I apologize for being three minutes over time. I hope again that everybody has just a fabulous semester and everything goes smoothly this year. Um, I know FAFSA is a little different, not a little, a lot, but um, we just so appreciate everyone coming today and just be on the lookout for that follow-up email. And thank you guys again so, so much.